Welcome. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about what is the context in which we feel the most alive, and that facilitates our ability to get turned on rather than turned off within our intimate relationships. And how do these things play together? Because we can get both turned on, right, like an accelerator and turned off, like hitting the brakes at the same time, when the context is not aligned with what we need. So first, let's run the show reel. <laughs> All right, let's talk about context even more deeply. So what is context? Context is made up of two things, and I'm going to use her words here. The circumstances of the present moment, who you're with, where you are, whether the situation is novel or familiar, risky or safe, etc., and your brain state in the present moment, whether you're stressed or relaxed, trusting or not, loving or not, right now in this moment. It's also evidence that women's sexual response is more sensitive to men's than context, which we talked about a little bit in the last video. Mood, what's happening around us, relationship factors. So this is about your external circumstances and your internal state. So one of the examples she gives in the book is let's say you're bending down to tie your toddler's shoes and your partner comes by and spanks you in the butt. That might be super annoying, but the same spank during a sexual encounter might be a turn on for you. It's all about context, right? It's like being tickled. Sometimes tickling is appropriate and it's fun. Sometimes it's annoying as heck. For some people, it's annoying as heck all the time. For some people, they like being tickled in certain circumstances. So not only what is happening, but when and how, and what is my sensation of it? What's my perception of it? All of this is part of context. So when we look at women's sexual interest in general, a lot of research studies come up with a lot of similar factors that women cite as being part and responsible for their turn on. One is having a, a partner that they're attracted to, who respects them and accepts them as they are. Feeling trusting and affectionate in relationship, being confident and healthy emotionally and physically, feeling desired by their partner and being approached in a way that makes them feel special, and explicit erotic cues. So, these are all combined along with how do you feel about your body? What do you feel about your reputation? How big are your breaks right now? Are you afraid of getting pregnant or not? Are you feeling desired versus feeling used or feeling manipulated into sex? Although it is interesting because John Gottman did a study around uh, women in abusive relationships and found that some of the best sex they had was after after arguments or after abuse, which we've heard that before, right? A lot of people are like, oh, makeup sex and breakup sex are super, super great. So why is that? For many people, it's also a way of feeling securely attached. It's the one way that sometimes we're taught to come back together. And so when there's been a lot of discordance and we're feeling separate, that level of connection can feel very gratifying, very nurturing, which is why for some of us, we almost unconsciously create drama in order to get that response outside of our body. And we can do it without the abuse, the drama, the negativity. We can do it in a way that for us is safe and comfortable and playful. And that feels healthy to us. And that feels healthy to our partner. Now, even in the same way, our perception of how we are experiencing touch and pleasure also are context dependent in, a different, in different environments. In a safe environment, people's brains want to approach curiosity, desire. It's more open to those things. In stressful, dangerous environments, no matter what's happening, we activate avoidance, anxiety, and dread. So our context is gonna change how we respond to sex and sexuality, and the, even the possibility of sex with our significant others, with our partners, with whomever we're choosing to engage with. 
And now just to clarify, once again, when we're talking about pleasure, we're talking about different aspects of pleasure. So she likes to lay them out as enjoying, expecting, and eagerness. And then on the other side, we have emotional responses like sex and stress and love and disgust. And so these are all controlled in the same, and mediated in the same areas of the brain. So this is why we're also looking at how important it is to really make sure that we are feeding the things that nourish us, that make us feel confident, that turn on our accelerators, and then diminish or lower the impact of our breaks. To clarify even, even further, you can think of the enjoying system as reward, right? Does this feel good? How good does it feel? Or does it feel bad? How bad, right? Turning on the brakes. But then we have expecting. Expecting is what's coming next. So think of this like Pavlov's dog, right? They salivate when they hear the bell because they were trained to. The same thing happens in our sexual lives. So if I'm taught that every time I approach my husband and try to make out with him, it's going to lead to sex because that's where it always goes. And I want to make out with my husband. I don't really want to have sex. That expectation is going to turn on my brakes and probably prevent me from engaging. But this is how we've linked stimulus over space and time. So if we've had a series of bad sexual experiences or um, being shamed around our bodies, these this expectation that the same thing may happen, even if we know better, we have a healthier partner, we have someone that cherishes us, these can be still neurologically linked. And we get to move through and heal these in order to have a stronger desire and to unlink some of those expectations and create new expectations inside our own system. So that way, when the bell rings, we get to decide whether or not we're salivating in essence. Now think of eagerness as kind of the gas pedal. So it fuels us to move forward towards something, to become more curious, to start engaging more. When we activate it with attachment mechanism in healthy, secure relationships, we seek affection. And of course, when eagerness is activated with our sexual accelerator, we prefer, we pursue sexual stimulation. So this is like craving. This is like temptation. This is like moving forward into something. And so all of these emotions and all of these three, these three components are all tied together inside your system. And Emily in her book talks about the enjoying, expecting, and eagerness as the emotional one ring of the brain because they're all combined together. So when you hear me refer to the one ring, this is what we're talking about is that enjoying, expecting, and eagerness together. Thanks for watching. And you can find more on my sexuality and intimacy community membership page. The link is in the comments below. Take care.